Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. OK, so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Welcome to the first annual Microsoft Research Summer Number Theory Day. So I hope this will become a tradition. And we have five wonderful speakers here today. So uh, first, I'd like to introduce um, Kieran Kidlaya, who's a professor of mathematics at University of California, San Diego. And he will be speaking about the Robbins phenomenon, piatic stability of some nonlinear recurrences. Thank you. OK, I'd like to thank Kristen for the uh, invitation to come visit Microsoft. Uh, this talk will be about a joint project with Joe Bueller at uh, Center for Communications Research in San Diego, in La Jolla, really. Um, the, uh, the slides will be posted on my website later today. Uh, usually I, I would have them up before the talk, but I was still writing them until about 10 minutes ago. Um, and the preprint is not yet available either. I'm hoping that will be available in a few weeks. But, uh, if anybody is interested in more details, I can tell you about them afterwards. Uh, so this talk is about some uh, unexpected numerical stability in piatic floating point arithmetic. So what I'm going to do is first talk about piatic numbers and what floating point arithmetic is for piatic numbers, and then introduce some examples of computations that you can do with piatic numbers that have some kind of unexpected numerical stability. Um, and finally, at the end, say a little bit about how you uh, prove some partial results towards the conjectures that we observe numerically. We do not have complete uh, understanding of the phenomena here, but we do have some partial results. OK, so that's essentially the outline that I just went through. Um, OK, piatic numbers and floating point arithmetic. So, Probably most people here know what piatic numbers are, but just to make absolutely sure, I'll say it several different ways on this slide. So, Z, B, so P will always be a prime number in this talk. I didn't write that explicitly, but you can sort of guess from context. So P will be a, your favorite prime number, and ZP will, not, will denote not the ring of integers mod P, which it sometimes does, but the ring of piatic integers. Uh, so the piatic integers can be conceived of in at least three different ways. Actually, well, there's at least one way that I didn't write down using vid vectors, but you don't need to know that. But sort of more concretely, there are at least three different nice ways to think about the piatics. One is to think of doing base p arithmetic, where instead of finite strings of base p digits, the digits in base p are, of course, the, the integers from 0 to p minus 1. Instead of uh, finite strings of base p digits, you use infinite to the left strings of base p digits and just use the normal rules of base p arithmetic to compute with them. So you can do addition and multiplication in base p starting from the right and going to the left. And OK, if you, even if you have to go infinitely far to the left, it still makes sense to do this. Uh, so for instance, for p equals 2, if you take the string of all 1s um, and you add this to 1, you get a string of all zeros. So the string of all ones represents the additive inverse of one. In other words, this is minus one in, in the ring uh, Z2, um, which may be a familiar fact if you've thought about how to represent minus one on a computer. Uh, so you can think in terms of base p uh, digits. Um, a, more math, a more sort of structured mathematical way to think of it is to uh, take sequences in which the nth term of the sequence is, a, is an element of the ring of integers modulo p to the n. And the n plus first term of the sequence reduces to the nth term sequence when you reduce the modulus from p to the n plus 1 to p to the n. So these are, so to speak, coherent sequences of elements of the ring z mod p to the n. In other words, these are elements of the inverse limit of, this, of the sequence of rings z mod p to the n z. Where uh, z mod p to the n plus 1z maps to z mod p to the nz by 
reducing the, the modulus. So that's a second perfectly equivalent way to think of p at x. Uh, and the third, it, it, which uh, is the one that has the most flavor of analysis, is uh, define the p at x absolute value, which is for each integer n, uh, you declare the size of n to be p to the minus v sub p of n, where v sub p in this talk will always denote the p at x valuation, i.e. the the exponent of p and the prime factorization of n, which might be 0 if p does not appear. So uh, the more divisible that n is by p, the smaller its p adic valuation becomes. So this is somehow uh, inverse to the usual notion of size. But uh, if, you, if you, you can complete this ring z for this p adic absolute value, and you get the same thing that I've described in the other two cases. Um, and you can do uh, this. This description has the advantage that you can also apply it directly to rational numbers because the p-adic valuation uh, is perfectly well defined for rational numbers too. It might be negative uh, if you have p's in the denominator, but you can still talk about all right. Rational numbers, non-zero rational numbers, also have prime factorizations. And once you convince yourself that oh, you should the absolute value of zero should of course be zero. Uh, that completely defines the p adic absolute value on rational numbers. And you can complete q for this p adic absolute value, and you get something called qp, which as a ring is just zp with p inverted. So in terms of strings, uh, these are again infinite to the left strings of base, in base p, except now they're not integral. You might have a, uh, the base p version of a decimal point and finitely many digits to the right of that. So you have some p denominators, of course, finitely many of them. Um, so, you, and, and so you can represent things in this way using a, a, a whatever you call a decimal point in base p, you know, because decimal means 10. So I don't know what you call it in base p. But let's say you call it a decimal point. Uh, you can use this representation, or you can use this completion representation. The inverse limit representation doesn't work quite as well, but you can fix it if you want. So OK, those are the p -adics. So that's what we're going to be talking about throughout this talk. Now, why are we talking about p -adic numbers? So this is, this is sort of an advertisement for why uh, the topic of this talk is of some relevance. So right, this, this definition of p -adic numbers uh, was given by Hensel around 1900 or so. Um, and the idea was to translate ideas from analysis, real analysis, complex analysis, into number theory. Um, and the, the, that you see that most formally by using the p -adic absolute value interpretation. So if you think of qp as the completion of q for the p -adic absolute value, then um, that is somehow analogous to completing q for the ordinary absolute value to get the real numbers. And certain operations that you can run the real numbers have parallels in the p -adics that have some number theoretic significance. For instance, if p is an odd prime, uh, and n is an integer which is congruent to a perfect square mod p, then it's, a, it's an elementary exercise in number theory that it's, uh, it is also a perfect square modulo p squared and p cubed and so on. Uh, and in fact, it is a square in, uh, in zp. It has exactly two square roots in the, in, in the field qp, which both happen to belong to the ring zp. And you can even construct these square roots using uh, an analog of um, whatever you call this iteration, where you 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 start you find a root of a polynomial by uh, this iteration, where you correct your approximate root by subtracting the value of f divided by the value of f prime. In other words, you correct the error as if f were linear, and you repeatedly do that, and you get a. So in this case, if you start with a an approximation of the square root, which is correct mod p then uh, this iteration will be quadratically convergent. The number of correct digits will double each time you do this. So it's a very efficient way. I mean, you could, of course, you could try to compute the digits one at a time by just some elementary uh, argument. But the Newton iteration gives you a quadratic convergent. It doubles the number of digits each time. So if you wanted 1,000 digits, you would need only 10 steps or so. So, so not just. Uh, to not just definitions, but also algorithms from analysis 
translate very nicely uh, into the p-adic framework. Now, we'll hear various things about p-adic numbers during the day. I suppose the, the final talk today will have some, some p-adics in it. Um, just to give an advertisement more in the direction of computational number theory um, and ap applications in cryptography, say, uh, one thing that comes up in computational number theory and, and cryptographic applications is you have an elliptic curve or a hyperelliptic curve over a finite field, and you want to know um, the zeta function, say, which is essentially the information of the number of points on the curve uh, over all possible finite fields. So uh, there are algorithms involving p-adic numbers for this, which have been considered by a great many people. Um, I think Sato was the first person to, to do this in the elliptic case. Uh, and then I looked at this a lot in the hyperelliptic case. Uh, and a actually, if you fire up uh, one of the standard sort of number theoretic computer algebra systems, you will find code written that does p-adic arithmetic computations for this, for this and various other problems. So, so p-adic numbers are, are used all over number theory these days, both on the, the theory side and, so to speak, on the, the practical side. So when you do p-adic, so this talk will dr drift more to the practical side, although there's quite a lot of of algebra hiding that will poke out near the end. Um, but for the moment, let me emphasize uh, a, a concern on the practical side. There is an obvious difficulty in computing with p-adic numbers. Um, and it's the same obvious difficulty that occurs with trying to compute with real numbers. Uh, if you think about uh, a real number, an arbitrary real number can only be specified by uh, an infinite uh, number of digits, say in base 10, uh, you need an infinite number of decimal digits to, uh, to exactly specify a particular real number. Um, there are certain real numbers that can be specified with, uh, with in finite data, like rational numbers, um, but arbitrary real numbers cannot be described using finite amount of data if for no other reason than the number of things you can describe in finite data is countable and the, num and the real numbers are uncountable. So no cleverness is going to solve that problem. And the same thing is true of p-adics. The, the cardinality of the p-adic numbers is again uncountable. It's the cardinality of the continuum. So you're not going to be able to represent arbitrary p-adic numbers, say, to a Turing machine. Uh, and so you're not going to be able to store them exactly on a computer. So this is a problem. Um, so the way you deal with this with real numbers is you don't deal with exact real numbers. You deal with approximate real numbers and pretend that they're good enough for your purposes. Um, and there are various ways to do that, which have analogs for the p-adics. And the one I'll consider this talk is the p-adic analog of floating point arithmetic, which uh, I suppose before computers was called scientific notation. But uh, so. What is floating point arithmetic? Well, float, what is floating point arithmetic for real numbers? Well, if you imagine a real number, uh, if you imagine its decimal expansion, so it'll have some uh, digits before and after the decimal point. The way you represent something in floating point arithmetic is you write it as a power of 10 times a real number, and you and of course you can shift powers of 10 in and out of the the leftover real number part. So you rescale so that there are uh, well, in scientific notation, I suppose you scale things so that there's exactly one digit in front of the decimal point. Uh, for floating point arithmetic, maybe it's more conventional to shift it so that there are no digits in front of the decimal point, and the first digit after the decimal point is non-zero. So you normalize the, the, the cofactor in some way um, by adjusting the power of 10. So you can do the same thing in p-adics. So right, any p-adic number can be written as, so any p-adic number can be written as a power of p, positive, negative, or 0, times um, an element of zp, wh who's, uh, which is not 0 mod p. So in other words, if you imagine the base p digits, uh, if you can always multiply by a power of t to align the string so that the first non-zero digit occurs in the unit's place. 
That's uh, so you can you can you can always represent a p-adic number as a power of p times a a, a p-adic integer with non-zero units digit, which is to say it's a unit in the ring of p-adic integers. Uh, so in so to make approximations using that normalization, what you do is you fix a positive integer r, which is going to be the maximum relative precision of the numbers you're writing down, and any given p-adic number will be approximated by a rational number, which is a form p to the e times m, where e is an integer, which is uh, my, the exponent, and m is an integer in the range from 0 to p to the r minus 1, which is not divisible by p. And this is called the mantissa, again, by analogy with usual floating point arithmetic. So you've got, uh, yeah, so you strip out all powers of p uh, so that the bit that's left over is, um, is a p-adic integer not divisible by p, and then you truncate it so that you're only keeping track of r digits in base p. Because you want, uh, you want the computations to be, to be finite, so you truncate in that way. So that's some scheme for approximating um, p-adic numbers. And of course, when you approximate things that you really want to compute exactly, you create some errors, and these errors will propagate through the computation. And in floating point arithmetic, it certain should be a familiar phenomenon that the errors that propagate through floating point arithmetic have the potential to get worse and worse as you go along, because you know, they can compound. If you're off by you know, 10 to the minus 5 in one, uh, in one quantity and 10 to the minus 5 in another quantity, and you add them, you, the, the result might be off by 2 times 10 to the minus 5. So you have this compounding problem. Uh, you have the same thing for p um, but it's not quite as bad. So let me first quantify what I mean by accuracy, and then I'll explain how accuracy degrades in floating point arithmetic. So by the accuracy of a p floating point approximation to a p number, if the p number is x and the p approximation is p to the e times m, what I'll say is, um, Look at m minus p to the minus e times x. So take the difference and divide by p to the e, sort of, sort of to renormalize, and then look at the p-adic valuation of the result. Uh, unless that's less, unless that's negative, in which case I, I don't allow accuracy to be less than zero. If the accuracy is zero, I give up and say, well, now I've lost, I've lost any control. Um, you might prefer to set, have the accuracy 0 still mean something and have the accuracy minus 1 be lose all control. But to avoid any annoying corner cases, I'm just going to declare that when, once the accuracy is 0, then I give up. Uh, I have no, no information anymore. So what the, in words, what this equation is doing is counting the number of correct p-adic digits of the mantissa starting from the right. Uh, at least that's, that's what it's doing if the exponent is, so to speak, the correct exponent for x. Um, right? You could imagine having an, a, an approximation where you even wrote down the wrong exponent, and then it would be a really bad approximation. Uh, so for example, if, if, if I take minus 1, which of course is, remember, that's the p-adic number, which is the p-adic integer represented by a string of 1s going infinitely far to the left uh, when p equals 2. So minus 1 in base 2, if I, if I write down these floating point approximations of it, uh, where these are meant to be integers in base 2, that's what the subscript 2 means, then this has accuracy 3, because it has three digits correct at the end. Any digits that happen to be correct over here don't matter, because as soon as you have a, an incorrect digit, you stop keeping track. Uh, and likewise here, you only have one correct digit before you, you uh, go wrong. Um, this is not a valid approximation because in my floating point approximations, I insist that the last digit always be 1. Uh, so this is, sort of a, this is not even a valid approximation. This is a valid approximation, but it has the exponent wrong. So if you look at what, hap if you look at what happens when you compare, um, uh, well, I mean, you can go through this definition, and you'll see that the, uh, the accuracy comes out to be 0. So, um, 
So essentially, if you have the wrong exponent, then the, evalu the, the approximation is useless. Okay, so this is when I talk about the accuracy of a floating point approximation. This is what I'm going to mean. So sort of the number of digits uh, at starting from the right that are correct in the Mantessa. Okay, and now how do addition and multiplication affect the accuracy of an approximation? Well, let me start with multiplication because that's that behaves very well. If I have two numbers x and y and these approximations of them, then it's clear what I should take as a floating point approximation of x times y. That should be times. Uh, maybe fix that. Uh, so that should be x times y. So it's clear that this is somehow a reasonable approximation to take. Uh, and in fact, it's such a good approximation that the accuracy is no less than the minimum of the accuracies of the original two approximations. So if this is accurate to five digits and this is accurate to seven digits, then this approximation will, will be accurate to at least five digits. Uh, so in some sense, there's no, there's no additional loss of accuracy when you do a multiplication. The only, loss of a the only uh, degradations of the approximation are the ones that came in to the two inputs. And you don't even, and they don't even compound. You just take the, you take the, you know, the worst of the two. So this is, in some sense, even better than for real numbers. In real numbers, you always have to compound. You always have to add uh, the losses of accurate, the sort of error terms. But here, you just, you take the the minimum of the two accuracies, and that's the accuracy of the approximation of the product. Um, you can this addition uh, is not quite. So straightforward. Let's see, I need to click on that to make that go. Uh, so addition is not quite so straightforward. So what do you do? Of course, you, you should try adding these two approximations. But of course, this will just give you some number, which you then have to rewrite in the form p to the exponent times mantissa. And then you have an, so so first you have to collect the powers of p, um, and then you might have to round the mantissa, because the mantissa might have gone out of your range, right? It's all, it, you 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 may have to truncate it to r uh, digits. So for example, if e1 is strictly less than e2, then the the power you're going to get is just e1, because when you add these two things together, m1 plus uh, that should be sub. So oops. Oh, that hasn't been fixed yet. So when you add these two things together, m1 is not divisible by p. And this is a positive power of p times a p-adic integer. So this is divisible by p. So the result is not divisible by p, because you have one thing that with non-zero units p-adic digit and one thing with zero units p-adic digit. So this is, this, is now, this is now a valid mantissa, except for the fact that it might have too many digits. So when I write, the, when I write brackets, I mean round the number of digits. So if, if, if these two things have different valuations, then all you have to do is round. And if you stare at this for a minute, you see that the, the accuracy you get is no less than the minimum accuracy of the, of the two original approximations. So in this case, again, the operation is exact. You don't experience any further loss of accuracy beyond what came into the computation. And likewise, if E2, I mean, the thing is completely symmetric. So if E1 is bigger than E2, the same argument applies in reverse. So where, where do you lose accuracy? You lose accuracy if the two things, uh, if the two numbers you're, pu you're putting in have the same p-adic valuation. Or you may lose accuracy in that case. And the reason is because th in this case, uh, it looks good for, at first. You factor out the p to the e1, and you just add the two mantissas. Um, but uh, of course, this is only a valid floating point approximation if the sum of m1 and m2 is not divisible by p. So if it is divisible by p, 
here's the, you, you get a problem. If the evaluation is f strictly bigger than 0, you then have to shift a power of p to the f from the, from the, the, the sum of the mantissas into p to the e1 before you do the rounding. And in terms of digits, this had the effect of, you know, you start with, say, r digit of p adic digits, which you know are correct, say, if you have no loss of accuracy beforehand. So then you add these two things, and there's you know, the sum of two things which are known to, f digit, to r digits is going to be known to r digits. But then you have to divide by p to the f, so you shift. You have all these zeros at the right that you have to shift out. And what comes into, uh, at the left may or may not be the correct p adic digits anymore for the, for the things you're actually computing. So you're essentially adding th as many garbage digits at the left as uh, you have zeros that appear on the right. So this is the source of uh, compound, this is the source of loss of accuracy. And that you might expect, uh, if you perform a sequence of arithmetic operations using p adic floating-point arithmetic, uh, typically, you exp experience progressive loss of accuracy over the course of the computation because you encounter this situation over and over again, and you kind of introduce more and more garbage digits. Uh, and so, if you you can you can sort of witness this firsthand if you do piadic number computations in Magma or Sage, you, you, things really do get worse and worse as you go along, and so. Uh, you're, you're forced to consider questions that are analogous to, to questions in what's called numerical stability. Right? There's, a, there's quite a large subject of mathematics devoted to the problem of doing various computations in such a way so as to uh, limit losses of accuracy in floating point computation. So for example, numerical, numerically stable linear algebra is, is a whole subfield of I suppose, linear algebra, uh, where you are sometimes forced to do things in quite a different way than you might expect in order to avoid, uh, in order to avoid losses of precision. So it's, it's kind of algorithmic algebra of, of quite a different flavor than we might be used to in number theory. Um, but if, but now if we want to do piadic number computations, then we do have to think about numerical stability from the piadic point of view. So it's not uh, completely. Uh, irrelevant to our to our computations, what uh, how, how one manages loss of accuracy. So there's a there's a general framework you can use to try to to, to study this. But in this talk, I'm not going to talk about the general problem of <laughs> of studying piadic numerical stability. Um, I want to talk about some cases of unexpected numerical stability. So cases where you do a computation, and you expect a certain amount of loss of accuracy. And in fact, you lose much less than you thought. Uh, these cases appear to have some deep algebraic origin, which is not completely understood, although what we do in the rest of the talk will give some partial explanation. Um, I should maybe mention that for those of you who have heard me talk about doing, uh, or, or me or, or some collaborators talk about doing computations of zeta functions using p-adic methods, p-adic cohomology methods. There are examples of numerical stability, of surprising numerical stability there. But those are essentially uh, doing linear computations. So they have sort of linear, uh, linear algebra computations. So they have, in some sense, linear explanations. So those, are, those led me to consider these things. That's somehow my original motivation for considering what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the talk was motivated by having seen those, that, those examples um, doing linear computations, but these turn out to be much deeper. And you'll see there's, there are a lot of nonlinear things happening. We'll be doing a lot of divisions and um, encountering some strange cases where you don't really lose precision, even though you think you should. So, OK. So, so I want to, so I'm going to go back to, uh, so, uh, well, I'm not going back in some sense. So now I want to describe an observation made by David Robbins in the early 2000s. It was published um, just after he died in 2005 um, of an example of one example that he he was working with that turned out to have uh, this surprising 
numerical stability. And this is the example that kind of triggered the work that we're doing here. So, um, and it comes from uh, a bit of 19th century mathematics, um, which uh, starts out with, uh, with a, a little uh, matrix identity, which is due in, its, in this level of generality to Jacobi. There are special cases due to other people. But this version is due to Jacobi. Uh, if you take an n by n matrix, and uh, that should be the determinant of m. So this is a, uh, an identity involving various determinants. One of them is the determinant of the whole matrix. But um, you consider various submatrices as well. And I'll have an example on the next slide. There's the, but but uh, let me state the identity first. So if you take the determinant of m, but you also look at, uh, so m is an n by n matrix. But now there are four different submatrices of size n minus 1 that are sitting in the top left, the top right, the bottom left, and the bottom right. So for instance, a is the determinant of the matrix uh, of size n minus 1 sitting in the top left. So you chop off the bottom row, uh, the bottom row and the right column. And likewise, b is sitting in the top right. C is sitting in the bottom left. D is sitting in the bottom right. And E is the n minus 2 determinant of the n minus 2 submatrix sitting in the middle. So you chop off all the outside rows and columns. And then the identity of Jacobi, which uh, is an entertaining thing to prove if you've never seen it before, uh, is that AD minus BC equals EF. So if you take the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix formed by A, B, C, and D, you get the determinant of F times the determinant of this thing in the middle. Well, you figure, if you imagine these things are homogeneous polynomials of degrees n minus 1, uh, n, and n minus 2, then you need the e in there to balance. So the th both sides have degree uh, twice n minus 1. Uh, so this is a, little, uh, a fun little identity. Uh, just to illustrate it, so if I take this 3 by 3 matrix, OK, a is the determinant of the top left corner, b is the determinant of, uh, of the top right corner, c is the determinant of the bottom left corner, d is the determinant of the bottom right corner, uh, e is in this case the one by one determinant in the middle, so it's just the, uh, the entry in the middle. Um, if I did a larger example, which I will a little bit later, there will, this will actually itself be a determinant. And f is the determinant of the whole thing, which since it's three by three, we remember how to compute it, turns out to be five, and then we can check that uh, 3 times 10 minus minus 3 times minus 5 is the same thing as 3 times 5. Uh, so one thing you're supposed to take away from this is that uh, it might not be obvious when you first start doing this computation that this times this minus this times this will be divisible by this. It's not obvious that AD minus BC will be divisible by E. Um, but of course it is because the quotient is f, and the determinant of a matrix with integer entries is an integer because we have another way to write it as a polynomial in the entries, say, from the definition in terms of summing over transversals. So uh, this identity forces an interesting divisibility property of AD minus BC, which can be used to construct interesting examples of, of recurrences that involve rational functions that give you integer entries. So for example, the uh, there are some examples due to Conway and, and, and Conway and Guy, maybe, of things called number freezes that, behave, that, uh, give a, that come up this way. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about uh, a, a, a proposed application of the Jacobi identity, which is due to a mathematician by the name of Charles Lutwidge Dodson, um, who in, uh, in his spare time was, was the children's author Lewis Carroll. But for the purposes of this talk, he's Dodgson, because this is from his day job as a mathematician. Uh, so, so Dodgson proposed to use Jacobi's identity as a method to compute determinants. Because uh, right, essentially, what it, right, if you haven't, uh, well, let me just say what the algorithm is. So given a square matrix M, so in this, in this picture at the bottom, this is the matrix M. 
So I successively compute connected minors of size k from those of size k minus 1 and k minus 2. So if you imagine the entries of the matrix that I start with are the one by one minors. Right? The minors are the are sort of determinants of square submatrices, and the one by one submatrices are just the entries. Um, the one by one submatrices are the entries. The, uh, to get started, I need zero by zero submatrices. So I declare that the, the determinant of the zero by zero matrix is one. Uh, so, so I need a whole bunch of ones to get started. And so, right, using, uh, so the first step in this algorithm is I start with my one by one minors, and then I compute the two by two minors by, well, you can imagine that this is a special case of, of the Jacobi identity, where I take this times this minus this times this divided by this. But of course, it's just the usual formula for the two by two determinant. So uh, I, I used Sage to do this. So I hopefully got the right answer, uh, modular transcription error. I mean, Sage did, Sage did it right. I hope I copied it correctly. So when you compute the two by two subdeterminant, so for example, this one is minus 6 minus 1 is minus 7, and so on. OK, then the next, so now I have the, so now I can throw away this, and I keep the 1 by 1 and the 2 by 2 minors, and I can use Jacobi's identity again to compute the 3 by 3 minors. And uh, I, I put some interesting entries in the middle here so that there's some, uh, some falsifiability. There's some possibility, of course, a priori, there would be some possibility of getting interesting denominators when you've add by these things. But the truth of the Jacobi identity ensures that when I take uh, you know, this times this divide, minus this times this and divide by this, I get uh, this looks like there's a sign error here. Oh, minus, th right, there's a sign here. So set plus 7 minus plus 4 divided by minus 3 is minus 1. So I did, in fact, copy this correctly from Sage. And you can check the other ones yourself. Uh, so that gives me the, so these are the 3 by 3 minors of my original 4 by 4 matrix. So from the 2 by 2 and the 3 by 3 minors, I run the, thing, the, the process one more time. And I get, so I take this, this times this. So one, minus 1 times minus 2 minus minus 4 times minus 1 divided by minus 1. And I get plus 2, uh, which is, in fact, the determinant. Uh, so Dodgson called this condensation for uh, a natural reason. As you move along this process, you you're, you're working with smaller and smaller matrices. So you're, in some sense, condensing the original matrix towards its determinant. So you start with this 4 by 4 matrix and this auxiliary 5 by 5, which is the minors. And then you, you, turn, you replace it with a 4 by 4 and a 3 by 3, 3 by 3 and 2 by 2, 2 by 2, and the 1 by 1 that you're looking for. So you condense towards the determinant. OK. Uh, so this, ha this has some nice features, uh, not all of which were formulated by Dodgson, but which are apparent in modern hindsight. Uh, so you can check that this is an O of n cubed algorithm, just like any other reasonable algorithm for computing determinants, like Gaussian elimination. So of course, it, uh, on one hand, that means uh, it, it's not going to get Henry Cohen excited. It's not going to solve the fast matrix multiplication problem. But it's not any worse than any other natural uh, algorithm for computing determinants. So it's a reasonable, way, it's a reasonable algorithm in terms of complexity. Um, it also has these extra bits of algebraic structure. The intermediate terms belong to the same ring as the entries of the original matrix because they are determinants of submatrices. So for example, if M has integer entries, then all of the intermediate terms are integers, not, not, not more general rational numbers. Um, this, on one hand, helps reduce the size of the numbers involved, because you don't, you're not carrying around numbers with big numerators and big denominators. You're just carrying around integers. Uh, also, uh, I think this is something that Dodgson remarked on. If you're doing this by hand, which he would have been in uh, in the 19th century, 
uh, if you're doing these computations by hand, uh, it's very useful to have error checks to help you confirm that you didn't make a mistake. And the fact that a, a D minus B C is divisible by E uh, might be a very good check. So it, uh, for hand computations, it was actually a very nice algorithm. Um, a, an, al a, a, an observation which I don't think Dodgson made, because he wouldn't have been interested in uh, large scale computations, but uh, is, is relevant in the modern world, is that condensation is, is highly parallelizable um, with very little communication, right? Because each step of the operation is, so imagine you have a square grid of processors, and each one is keeping track of a, uh, a k minus, a k minor and a k minus one minor. Then you, each one wants to compute a k plus one minor. Well, it essentially only has to commu com compu con com communicate with a couple of neighbors in order to do that. So you, it has very, very good storage properties. It's very little communication, and everything can happen in parallel. I mean, it's 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 a fantastically nice algorithm for um, from that point of view. Uh, I don't actually know whether much use has been made of this in the real world, um, and probably that's because of the the incredibly serious disadvantage. Uh, of the condensation algorithm, which is that it doesn't always work. This is, this is a bit of a problem with describing an algorithm. I mean, I, I shouldn't really use the word algorithm here, because an algorithm is generally thought to mean something that actually succeeds in computing what it's supposed to compute. And condensation does not do so, because there's this tiny little problem that one of these things that you have to divide by might be 0. Uh, this does not falsify the Jacobi identity, because that just means, in this case, AD minus BC is also equal to 0. But it means that you can't solve for F in this equation, because all you know is that 0 equals 0. Uh, so this is, this is a problem. And Dodgson observed this. Uh, in his examples, he observed it didn't occur very often for him, because um, sort of random numbers are generally not going to be 0 with high probability. And even if they do occur, even if you do hit a 0, well, you have some hope because you know other things about determinants. For instance, if you switch two of the rows or columns of a matrix, uh, you change the determinant only by a sign. So potentially, you could try to manipulate the matrix in some way to essentially shake out one of, the, one of these 0 subminers uh, and then repeat the computation. Uh, this is not a very systematic description of what to do, uh, which is maybe why condensation never really took off as a, um, as a, as a method. But one can do it. So OK, so as I said, condensation has these incredible feature, incredibly good features and this incredibly bad feature. Um, uh, so because of the very bad feature, it went ignored for a very long time uh, until until Robbins started looking at, the, looking at it. And, and Robbins had the idea that, well, he was interested in computing determinants of matrices over FP. Uh, and he, he realized, well, if, if, you have, if you're working over FP, OK, you might hit a 0 some point during the condensation process, and then you're a bit stuck. But you could work around this problem by lifting the problem to Z so that uh, something that starts out being 0 lifts to something which is only guaranteed to be 0 mod p. And so it has a very good chance of being non-zero. Right? So right, the, since the condensation recurrence is completely algebraic, uh, it commutes with ring homomorphisms. So if you lift your matrix from fp to z, compute its determinant by condensation, and then project down, you get the correct answer over fp. Um, now this is not ideal, ideal because working over z means dealing with integers that get very, very large. So that if, and if your matrix, say your matrix is 100 by 100, even if you start out with numbers in the range from 0 to p minus 1, well, the determinant of the matrix over z might be, might have 100 digits in base p, because it's a polynomial of degree 100 in the entries. So uh, you get some very large integers you don't, that you don't want to deal with. So, but of course, you only want the answer mod p. Uh, 
So what Robin said was, well, you can't quite do everything over ZP because you have to do these divisions along the way. So you might divide by things which are not 0 but are divisible by powers of p. So you can't work in, Z, you, you can't work in fixed precision in ZP. You can't work in Z modulo a fixed power of p. But you can do floating point arithmetic with a fairly small relative precision. For instance, if it fits in a machine word, then that makes it very efficient. So for example, if p is 2 and your modulus is you know, 2 to the, your relative precision is less than, say, 64, this works quite well. Uh, but to get an answer, you have to guarantee that the, the final uh, results, the approximation of the determinant that you end up with, has accuracy at least 1. You, right? you, need to, you need to know that there is at least one digit correct at the end so that when you reduce mod p, that digit is guaranteed to be the correct value of the determinant. So Robbins was then led to test numerical stability of condensation and, discover, and he discovered that accuracy losses don't compound the way he was expecting. Um, so let me state what he observed. What he observed, uh, so M is a square matrix with entries in ZP. Uh, and I'm going to represent each entry of the original matrix with a p-adic floating point approximation of accuracy at least r. So r is going to be the relative, maximum relative precision that I start with. Um, and then I'll do the computation of condensation using floating point arithmetic. And along the way, I divide by various uh, p-adic numbers. They're, in fact, all p-adic integers, assuming I don't run out of digits. But uh, so let d be the maximum p-adic valuation of any denominator that I encounter. Uh, there. And then let a be the accuracy of the computed determinant, which I'll actually compute as an absolute accuracy. In other words, I won't renormalize. I'll just take the difference between the computed determinant and the actual determinant and take the p-adic valuation. So this is going to say something slightly stronger than uh, computing its relative precision. Um, uh, actually, no. It's going to maybe say something slightly weaker. But this is what I'm going to. Uh, this is what I'm interested in at the end. I'm interested in making sure that the. I want. I want to know that a is at least one. Right. I want to know that the thing that I computed is correct mod p, so that when I reduce mod p, I am comp correctly computing the determinant of the original mod p matrix. And what Robbins observed by doing. Uh, Billions of examples uh, with, for small p's, mostly p equals 2, but I think he tried some other small p's also. What he observed numerically is that this, the accuracy of the approximation is always the relative precision minus this maximum valuation. In other words, the loss of, the loss of accuracy is bounded by the single largest denomination, valuation of a denominator, which is essentially the, the single largest loss of accuracy at an individual step the computation, which is not what you, this is not what you observe typically. Typically, you observe that when you lose accuracy at multiple steps, uh, you, those, uh, those losses compound. But you don't observe that in this case. And uh, what we have proven is a weaker statement along these lines. We prove that if you, if you add a factor of 3 here, then, then you, get a, you, you, you get, do get a true lower bound. Um, of course, you would like to get rid of the factor of 3, especially because experiments suggest that this is really best possible. Um, this, th you get equality quite often here. So we would like to get rid of the factor of 3. But uh, if I have time at the end to show a bit about how the proof goes, you will see there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a gap in our methods that prevents us from doing that. But we do prove a qualitative version of this observation that uh, the loss of accuracy is controlled not by the sum of losses of accuracy during the computation, but by the maximum, which is uh, very much very much not the typical case. If you just if you just try computations um, of not of this special form, you experience the generic case. Okay, so. Uh, in order to prove this, one so it's actually kind of complicated to work directly with the condensation recurrence. So uh, our approach to proving this was to actually generalize first, try to figure out 
uh, a more general class of statement of which the conjecture of Robbins is a special case and try to give some unified proof of these. So uh, this can be illustrated by taking additional examples. So here's an example that is pretty different but has a similar shape to the Robbins, uh, or to the condensation, the, the uh, Dodgson equation. Uh, this, is, this is an observation of Michael Somos originally that if you start with four elements of a ring, uh, say R is an integral domain, and you start with x0, x1, x2, and x3, which are units in that integral domain, and then you compute this, this uh, fractional, this, this recurrence in rational functions, xn plus 4 is xn plus 1 times xn plus 3 plus xn plus 2 squared divided by xn, then uh, despite the fact that you do divisions along the way, every term in this recurrence is guaranteed to be in the original ring. So any denominators that you, you might see actually cancel out. Any denominators introduced by this thing are actually canceled out by divisibility in this thing. And there is an interpretation of this in terms of uh, elliptic, uh, I suppose, elliptic divisibility sequences, uh, which I will not introduce. But uh, I'll give a different explanation of why this is true later. Uh, but, now, but let me. Uh, state a version of the Robbins observation for this, for this recurrence. So if, if I take R to be the p-adics, and now again I represent each initial term of the recurrence with a p-adic floating point approximation of accuracy at least R, then compute the recurrence out to xn using floating point arithmetic. Again, let D be the maximum p-adic valuation of any denominator that I see, and let A denote the absolute accuracy of the comp computed value of xn. So the, the, the p-adic valuation of this thing minus the, uh, the computed version. Uh, then we prove that actually uh, the, the same inequality as in Robbins conjecture holds, and this time it's a theorem. So we prove that the accuracy here is always at least the number of correct digits to start with minus the maximum valuation of any denominator along the way. So, so there, there, clearly there are other examples where you get this control of the loss of precision loss of accuracy. Um, and so this suggests making a general definition. If you have a recurrence defined by rational functions defined over ZP, you can talk about the A, R, and D, as I had before, the absolute accuracy, the initial relative precision, and the denominator valuation. Um, if, you have, if you always have A greater or equal to R, time, R minus D for any choice of the initial terms, we'll say the recurrence satisfies the strong Robbins phenomenon. And if you have to stick a, a constant factor in front of, the, in front of this, this guy here to get the bound, uh, then I'll say it has the re weak Robbins phenomenon with a correction factor. So here's an example where the correction factor is needed. So this is another example that was investigated by SOMOS. It's the SOMOS recurrence of length 6. It has the same pattern, uh, n plus 1, n plus 5, n plus 2, n plus 4, n plus 3 squared for xn. You can sort of guess what the pattern is. I should say the pattern only works up to 7. If you figure out what the analog is of, uh, with length 8, it does not have the right integrality property anymore. Um, so this one does have the integrality. x0 through x5 are units in integral domain. Then xn is in R. I believe this can be interpreted using the analog of elliptic divisibility sequence for a certain genus 2 curve. But I don't remember, so don't press me on that. Uh, I can look this up if necessary. But I'm not going to use that interpretation in this talk. Uh, so this has this unexpected integrality property. But when you try the Robbins phenomenon, when you work over ZP with floating point arithmetic, you observe that the, you, you, the bound a greater than equal, you don't get a bound a greater than equal to r minus d. You only get a bound a greater than equal to r minus 2d experimentally. And uh, our results are not strong enough to apply even that. We only get a correction factor of 5. Right? The, 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 the lower the correction factor, the better the result is, because you're getting a, 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 a stronger lower bound on, on A when you subtract less stuff. Um, so there are examples where you do get something like the Robbins phenomenon, but you need this correction factor, uh, and not just in the proof, sometimes even in the, statement, even in the optimal statements. Um, So there's, a, there's, a, there's something called the Laurent phenomenon that's been observed in algebra, I suppose, maybe combinatorics. There, there is an incredibly 
uh, rich theory of recurrences, which are computed by rational functions, but with the property that their terms can be expressed as Laurent polynomials in the initial data. So in particular, if the initial data are units, right, Laurent polynomials are polynomials where you allow negative powers of the, of the variables. So if you're plugging in units, you, you will actually get elements of the ring you started with. Um, if you plug in things that are not units, you will encounter some denominators, but they're controlled by the initial data. So recurrences that have this property are said to exhibit the Laurent phenomenon. Um, and there's sort of a unified theory. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't completely capture the whole Laurent phenomenon, but there is a unified theory uh, due to Fomin and Zelovinsky that captures many cases of the Laurent phenom phenomenon using something called the caterpillar lemma, which I won't try to state in this talk. Um, the caterpillar is a certain graph that has a shape like a caterpillar, and it's some combinatorial lemma involving this graph. Uh, I'll, I'll show an explicit example of it uh, on the last couple of slides. Uh, if you have an example of a recurrence uh, which has the Laurent phenomenon as explained by the caterpillar lemma, it also exhibits the weak Robbins phenomenon for a certain correction factor, which we can write out explicitly, but it's typically not the best possible one. Um, so for example, for condensation, this general, when we apply this general result to condensation, you get the weak Robbins phenomenon with a correction factor of 3, which is a theorem I stated earlier. But it's not best possible, conjecturally. The best possible correction factor should be 1. So, so this is a qualitative version of the Robbins phenomenon for Laurent recurrences. But it's not quantitative. It's not best possible. Um, and generally, if you have something not exhibiting the Laurent phenomenon, it doesn't exhibit the weak Robbins phenomenon either. The accuracies of approximations get worse and worse and worse as you go along. That's what I just said. OK. Um, there is a special class that we have identified that look like cases that satisfy the strong Robbins phenomenon. Uh, these are things that are related to cluster algebras, which I won't say what they are. But they have the property that the recurrences you look at uh, have to have two monomials sitting up here divided by a single term down here. So the SOMO6 sequence didn't have that property. But if I omit the, no, if I omit the middle term, then I have something that has this, so to speak, binomial shape. Uh, this is related to cluster algebras, and it experimentally exhibits the, the strong Robbins phenomenon. The correction factor drops to 1 in this case. Uh, I should say that if you don't make this restriction, uh, we conjecture, based on some evidence, that correction factors might be arbitrarily large. You can make it an example of recurrence with the weak Robbins phenomenon where the correction factor is 100. But for these special shapes, of which there are quite many that come from cluster algebras, uh, you get the Robbins phenomenon of 1. And I should say that condensation, of course, has this shape because it's AD minus BC over E equals F. So, so this, this includes the Robbins conjecture. Um, so uh, in the last three minutes or so, I just want to illustrate a, a, couple, a, a little bit of the al algebra under the hood that goes into the statements. So um, I won't go through this in much detail, but I will point out that uh, to, give, to, to get some idea of how you prove the Laurent phenomenon for, say, the SOMOS 4 recurrence, the rough idea is that instead of just trying to prove Laurent, that these things are Laurent polynomials in the input data, you, you make a stronger induction hypothesis. So you carry along cer certain extra terms. This, of course, is, is xn plus. This is the thing that computes xn plus 4. Uh, this is the thing that computes xn minus 1. So this is the term that steps the recurrence forward. This steps the recurrence back. And these two are slightly mysterious auxiliary terms. But they're cooked up so that when you try to do the induction, you can do it. Um, so for example, uh, if you want to step this process 1 forward, one of the things you have to check is that this thing with the indices shifted by 1 is, is Laurent polynomial. Uh, so when you write it out, you substitute for xn plus 4 using the recurrence. And then you get some funny things. And one of the things you get is precisely uh, this auxiliary term. And so you have something expressed both with an n plus 1 and with an n in the denominator. But you can also check by induction that any two of these 
four guys generate the unit ideal in the ring. Um, so you don't actually have see any denominator because you know you have two if you have two co-prime if you have uh, two different expressions of the same quantity um, with denominators that are co-prime, then there can't actually be any persistent denominator in the result. Um, so you actually do get, in this case, p-adic integer. Uh, okay, so you can use this observation. You can use this method to try to give an algebraic proof of of strong Robbins for SOMOS four. And the way you set it up is, okay, you imagine computing a sequence that starts out the same as your original sequence, but you modify the recurrence by putting in some, some junk terms. So you put in multiplicative factors of the form 1 plus p to the r times a variable. And this corresponds to the fact that, remember, your mantises are only stored to r digits. So there's always, any, anytime you write a, a down a, a, uh, an approximation, the ambiguity of, as to what p-adic number it represents uh, is represented by multiplying a factor of the form 1 plus p to the r times mystery number. So you put these factors in. Um, this, you have some discretion over how you could consolidate some of these factors. So you could, really, you could even get away with just one of them here. But let me put one in on each side. Um, and now, now I claim that if these things are in ZP, that the, the difference between the, va the, the valuation of the difference, yn minus xn, is at least r minus the maximum uh, valuation of any denominator. So just the, the y's that you count encounter up to x, the computation of xn. OK. And the way, the way, you, get, the way you prove that is you, you go through the proof of the Laurent phenomenon that I sketched on the earlier slide, and you show that it, well, if you modify the error, error term so that this one is divisible by yn and yn plus 2, and this is divisible by yn, yn plus 1, and yn plus 3. In other words, uh, each of these things is divisible by all of the y's, uh, all of yn through yn plus 3 that are not present in this product. So if you put all the, so to speak, missing variables in on each side, uh, then yn is actually a Laurent polynomial in the input data. Uh, and an ordinary polynomial in the error terms. Uh, so this follows by a, a careful modification of the original proof. And uh, this gives you the, the, the Robbins phenomenon with an error factor of 3. But I, I observed earlier that no two of these things can have a common factor. So really, you only get a 1 here, because these three things, can only, only one of them can actually be contributing anything. So you really only get a 1 here, and that's the strong Robbins in this case. Um, so the, my last slide is the analog of this for, for weak Robbins. So you can do a formally similar thing for Robbins and, and to again get the weak Robbins for, for condensation. And you get weak Robbins with a factor of 3. But in this case, it's not the case that these five guys uh, are forced to be co-prime. They could have more, they could share, right? I mean, if you just have ent ma uh, a matrix, it, it's possible that many of the minors can be divisible by powers of p. So you can't use the same trick as I used earlier to get rid of the, th to get the 3 down to 1 here. And this is why uh, the theorem that I stated about condensation has this factor of 3 in it. It's because I'm forced to have put three th terms in here to get an algebraic statement. Now, uh, the hope is that because this example is related to cluster algebras, if we show this to enough, enough experts in the theory of cluster algebras, which I'm hoping to do at MSRI this fall sometime, because there's a special program, uh, if I show this to enough experts in cluster algebras, one of them might explain why the theory of cluster algebras gives me a better algebraic statement than the one I got straight out of the Caterpillar lemma. So the hope is that by casting this in the language of cluster algebras, we can recruit some help from experts in that theory, get a better estimate, and really nail down the, the strong Robbins phenomenon for condensation. But, uh, this, as far as we've gotten right now, is this factor of three. So my time's up, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Questions? Hey. Uh, once that you have bounded the correction factor to some constant, uh, could be c equal to one or whatever, 
it, is there a way to recover this loss of data? Of, or oh, so if you know a bound on the correction factor, can you recover the missing digits? Yeah. Um, I suppose you mean without redoing the computation to more digits, because that's certainly one thing you can do, is you can try to just redo the computation with higher initial precision to, to correct for the loss that you experience along the way. Um, uh, I don't know a good way to recapture the precision that you've lost other than to start with more precision in the first place. But certainly that's the idea. That would be the, the thing you would want to do is figure out what the loss of precision is. And if you've lost too much precision, then go back and, and start with more. Um, but the, the Robbins phenomenon uh, helps you show that, I, I mean, the problem is, of course, that with, without doing the computation exactly, you don't uh, necessarily know exactly what the, the, the loss of accuracy is compared to the exact computation. So, uh, so you need this theorem to guarantee that the thing that you computed approximately has a certain number of correct digits. And if you need more digits, you can go back and repeat the computation with more digits to start with. This number uh, D, your sort of mm -hmm. most loss in any one step, mm -hmm. is there any indication that it doesn't get huge at any point? It could get huge. On the other hand, it is just the valuation of, so to speak, a random p adic number. So if you really believe that, then uh, it shouldn't be bigger than 5 with probability more than p to the minus 5. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, that's not a guarantee, but that's a good heuristic. And that's consistent with experiments.